Welcome to TEN, the Tenant Experience Network. I'm your host, David Abrams. In this episode, we are connecting with Steve Simone, founder of Bebot, which makes smart ordering technology for bars, restaurants, and hotels to make them run more efficiently. In this episode, we will learn about Steve's journey to his current role at Bebot, where he combines his experience working in the Navy as a nuclear engineer with his previous learning as a first-time founder. We will tap into his thinking around learning from failure as one of his keys to success. Hear more about the early days of his entrepreneurial journey and gain insight into why he thinks commercial real estate has an opportunity to reimagine how human interactions can create new social networks. We're excited to be sharing this podcast with you, so be sure to follow TEN so you never miss an episode of the Tenant Experience Network. Now I'd like to welcome Steve to the show. Really glad you could be with us today. How are you? Good. How are you doing today, David? I'm well, thank you. Uh, let's start with your journey to your current role as CEO of Bebot. Uh, how did you get started? Walk me through it and maybe a little bit more about your current role. Oh, yeah. Well, I got started um, probably five years ago in San Francisco when I was living out there. My my friends and I were trying startups. I feel like it's a, if you live in San Francisco and you're you're young, you always try a startup. The first one didn't go so well. Uh, and then Bebot was our, our second try, which um, started as a robotics company, weirdly enough. And now I'm in, fast forward, I'm in New York City, still running Bebot, but we're a software company serving restaurants. Cool. So I am curious. I know this is a bit of a segue right out of the gate. Yeah. But when did you know the first company or your didn't wasn't going to work? And what was that moment like? I'm just curious. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we spent the first. We started. Uh, me and my co-founder of that company started with a, an idea that we we saw as like a problem to solve for sales teams, um, and I think like we couldn't get traction. We couldn't get initial like product market fit after a couple iterations. Um, so then that always becomes the question: is should you pivot and try to find product market fit, or should you throw in the towel? And that's a really hard question for founders. I think about that all the time um, when you're in the pre-product market fit stage. And so what, you know, what we looked at was like, we looked at our founding team skill set based on the problem and the thing we were trying to build. And we were just like, it was going to be pretty, we just re, we came to the conclusion together. It was going to be tough to, to get to product market fit. So we, we, we uh, shut it down, but that is like the fundamental, fundamental question. It's really hard to answer. For any yeah, founder. I, I can only imagine as a founder that's probably got to be one of the the hardest things to to wrap your head around. Uh, so far, I'm not there. I hope to never be there. But <laughs> I, I admire you for going through the process and, and coming back at it. Um, yeah. So you mentioned that Bebot started in the robotics and ended up in 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 I guess the the food ordering, food service, restaurant business. Tell me, was there a, was that a pivot or what happened there? Yeah. So this time, I thought the you know, me and my co-founders, we had a lot of good skill sets. We were very technical and we knew we were, we wanted to build a really technical product. Um, so we, we were messing around with overhead ceiling delivery robots, which we built and launched. We got one customer on those, but that doesn't mean product market fit. Uh, as in, <laughs> you can get one paying customer on almost anything. Um, trying to get a second customer was proving to be challenging just because it's a, it's a very unique product. Uh, doesn't necessarily maybe not solve every customer's pain. It's kind of a novelty in many ways, but the software we had built around it for ordering um, was something that customers were raising their hand asking for. So it was a pivot to listen to the customers a little more okay. and away from listening to our hearts about wanting to be robotics engineers. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we, we just, we wanted to keep doing the startup together. We were having a lot of fun. So yeah, we, we pivoted to the market forces. Oh, good for you. Uh, so why do you think you were so uniquely suited to this opportunity and what helped you or contributed to success, whether it be skills, yeah. mentors, colleagues, books, school? W w tell me about that. Really a couple of things. Navy background. Uh, we, we happened to, I was a nuclear engineer in the Navy and um, ordering. So I didn't realize this at the time of pivot when we pivoted to the ordering software from, from the robots, but ordering software for a small business is like a safety critical mission critical system. 
similar to like a nuclear reactor on a submarine. Um, like they really, really rely on this stuff to take payments and orders. Um, so like we're, we take a lot of great care in trying to, you know, make it really mission critical software. Um, and then that was like one thing. So that background, the other piece was just simply, I, I caught the startup bug and I had failed a couple times at various things. And those, through those failures, I, I learned a lot about how to actually do it. So right. that combination is what, what I think is really helping, helping me lead the team now. Makes a lot of sense. Um, so I think you'll agree that living through a pandemic is absolutely horrible. It's not something any of us would have planned on or, or hoped for. Um, but that being said, I'm at a place now personally and, and with regard to how we're building Hilo that I no longer think the pandemic can be an excuse. Um, and to me, it's now a time to do better, be better, and build something better. You know, the companies where you you call them up and they tell you there's an, a longer wait time because of the current, you know, crisis or the current pandemic. I'm like, really? Like nine months later, you're still using that as an excuse? Um, so in terms of building something better, creating something better, if I was to give you an extra $100,000 right now of budget, what would you do? How would you spend it and why? Um well, it's definitely on more more product. Uh, customer demand for ordering software is very strong right now. Um, the pandemic, uh, you know, I, I always tell our customers like that there is light. I agree, it's not an excuse. There's light at the end of the tunnel, um, and I think we're you know we're months away from a pretty widely distributed vaccine. Um, so I'm just trying to I'm helping restaurants gear back up for the the grand reopening of people being out and about at restaurants and bars. And, and I totally agree with you. There is, there's no excuse. Agreed. Um, so listen, there's a lot we don't know uh, about what the return to workplace is going to look like. You and I are both selling into commercial real estate as one of our, uh, certainly our major, our, our, our most important target uh, yeah. for you. It's one of um, several, but I know it, the, the yeah. real estate sector is pretty important. Uh, we know that it's going to be much, uh, a much slower return. Uh, you know, in, in April, May last year, we were hoping July and July, we thought the fall and certainly this past fall, we now recognize that let's be, let's hope that it's sometime in 2021. Uh, we know that flexibility is going to be a major theme in commercial real estate. Um, we know that people were, are going to continue to work from everywhere, uh, including the home. Just wanted to get your thoughts on what you think this looks like going forward. Yeah, I think that, um, well, two things. One, there's going to be a, a work from home component. But before I address that, I think just on the commercial real estate um, owners and operators are really considering, you know, adding a lot of new digital tools right now. I talk to a lot of these people in New York City, and they're looking for solutions to be more like contactless for their their tenants, like having more um, digital experiences that they can they can render. Um, and this is like super important because when they reopen and things get packed again, like people are still going to want to be safe um, right. and and really have the convenience. Like they're really looking at evaluating this stuff now. So like that's one thing. So when it all comes back and New York City is raging again, I think it'll come back, but with more um, digital tooling. So I think you guys are doing a, a really smart thing. Um, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I would I would agree. And I think, you know, in a city like New York, um, I had a conversation with a with a, a, someone from the commercial real estate industry previously, you know, about it's not tech for the sake of tech, um, but if you're already doing a whole lot of things great, um, the challenge as people re-enter the workplace is that you're going to need technology to deliver that experience, to deliver on some of, you know, what, what is now even more important than perhaps what what it was before, like contactless, um, like, you know, um, occupancy management and, and visitor management. These are all themes that were important before, uh, but in a, a COVID or a post-COVID world become even more important. Yeah. And then on the, on the remote work front, I, I don't know how you run your business, but we're, we've been a remote company since 2017. So like, you're talking to someone who's pretty biased. I know the CRE owners out there won't want to hear this, but I just think remote for an entrepreneur is such a competitive advantage. So I'm a little bit, maybe I'm contra I just think that like I can hire people across the Midwest that can work and be really productive and you get access to a really large talent pool that way. Um, and so like, I, I really do think remote is, is here to stay. So I think CRE owners should be thinking about that and thinking about you know, opening up some of their office space if it's not going to all get filled and repurposing it for other convenient amenities. 
there's a yeah. lot of a lot of great building space in New York City and a lot of cool there's, you can do a lot of cool stuff with it and um, I don't know if you've seen Hudson Yards but yeah. they have a lot of like cool non office things in there like a lot of different experiences that they they have in there that aren't just purely office rental so it's yeah. really cool yeah. to see well I'm totally with you I, you know I, I think flexibility is what I think is going to be um, you know really important I I'm not necessarily a hundred percent aligned to a hundred percent remote. Um, you know, uh, my, I, I, I feel it, I think my team feels it, um, the lack of opportunity to come together, but we, do we need to come together and work every day in an office? Probably not. So, whereas, you know, pre COVID, we certainly probably thought that was the only way to be. Well, it wouldn't be a great podcast without some debate. <laughs> I, I really, I really think though, that I got on the remote front, like I know you, there's human interaction. I was thinking about this. How could we repurpose the CRE building, commercial real estate, for different human interaction? Maybe it doesn't have to be with your coworkers. Maybe it could be with just like your other people in your community. So, like when I was in my twenties, I did enjoy going out after work for a drink with my coworkers. Um, and I think I can you can still get that same experience as long as it's some humans. It doesn't have to necessarily be your coworkers. Right. So I'm wondering. I'm wondering if there's new like a new social network going to be formed and actually take place in a lot of these buildings, but maybe just not with your exact coworkers. Right. I don't know. So that's what I've been thinking a lot about that lately. I don't have a good answer, but. Okay. Well, I think that's interesting. You know, pre COVID at the end of 2019, uh, we did a couple of uh, workplace experience workshops um, in communities where Hilo was present and brought, you know, users, people who worked in our, in the communities that we served into a room with the uh, commercial real estate teams that managed those buildings and, and really did a deep dive into what that looked like. And, and to your point, a lot of them talked about connecting with other people within their neighborhoods, within their communities, networking opportunities, um, finding out about career opportunities within their neighborhoods and communities, um, lunch and learns, um, socials, you know, clubs. So I, I think you're right. I don't think that the, you know, the same way we don't look as building as silos, I don't think we have to look at attendance as a silo. Um, I think people ultimately want to find and meet like-minded people. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, lo I'm looking forward to that because I still want the human interaction. But also, if you saw inside of our company, you might think it a bit odd. Like me and my co-founders just went through like everyone's calendars and made them delete 25 hours plus of meetings that they've all had. Like we're, tr we're trying to get people to talk less in right. our remote company. It's like kind of a weird situation. We're like, no, you need time to focus on work. Like stop having these recurring meetings. So like, I'm, but we might be a little odd. So I don't know. <laughs> No, I think we've all come out of 2020 and we thought a lot about, I certainly did over the holidays, what am I going to do differently? Because 2020 was not sustainable. It was, you know, it was, it, you went into um, crisis mode and you just reacted and developed all these processes. For example, we met, we had a huddle every morning. Um, and what I've done personally is my team finds that very helpful, but I realized that, you know, I need time to do David work. And yeah. so now Tuesdays and Thursdays, I don't join the team huddle. I I, I take those mornings now and I'm 100%, no meetings, no calls, and I get work done. So I think it's evolving. And I think we all have to constantly look at what we're doing and think about what we want to do differently going forward, because it doesn't mean it has to be the same. Yeah, no, I, it's really, it's a, it's a really exciting time in the future of work category. I, I'm not a venture capitalist, but they always use the future of work buzzword. Right. And right. like, that is, it actually really is an exciting time thinking about that. So. I'm I'm, I am jealous of the, the investors in a way because I get to think about it more than me. <laughs> right. Uh, before we take a quick break, I'll just note that I, I believe on your sweatshirt, it says Kraft. I'm assuming that's Kraft Venture. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, so no, I'm doing a free advertisement. Shit. I was going to say, I know they're an investor of yours. I know that I'm a huge fan of David Sachs, which is one of the reasons why you and I connected. I um, hope someday to, to get that personal introduction. Um, but, uh, good for you for, for some promotion for the, oh, the yeah. I, do. I think I got to pay me for these adverts. I didn't realize, I didn't think about it. They got to pay me for this. I'm gonna tell them. <laughs> All right. We'll take a short break and we'll be right back. This episode of 10, the tenant experience network is proudly brought to you by Hilo. Hilo is a software solution used by building operators to attract tenants, boost revenues, and streamline operations by creating connected, engaged, and informed building communities. Building operators need to connect their tenants now more than ever before, recognizing that people will be working from everywhere, including the home, forever. Unlike apps that silo one building, 
The Hilo Tenant Experience Network is the only solution that connects people to their building community, network, and city where they work, live, or visit. To learn more about Hilo, visit HiloApp.com. Uh, we're back with Steve from Bebot. Um, continue the conversation. Uh, commercial real estate industry is moving faster towards recognizing that their core business is not just about building ownership. Um, some have debated with me whether or not that's true or not. Um, I think they certainly are moving, some fast, some not so fast. But rather, it really is about creating the best customer experience for their tenants uh, or their residents. And both you and I play in that, in that arena uh, to help make that possible. Um, so just wondering what you think uh, we, or how we will define uh, and deliver tenant experience in 2021. What will that look like? Hmm. So let me clarify the question, how we are going to deliver it, like both of our companies or? How will the industry define and deliver? How will companies like ours help define and deliver? Yeah, we're seeing a a variation actually um, across the board. Like some of them are, it depends on the, depends on how the CRE company has it established. Like some of them actually are bringing like dedicated, like a VP of technology buyer role that they're creating. And in that case, they're kind of doing like a central purchasing and then dissemination through like the, their, their buildings. Like, and then there are some that are more bottoms up approach that are like leaving it up to the surrounding restaurants and to some of the other, so like for, for particularly for my space, food ordering, some of them are trying to roll my product into apps like yours or platforms like yours. And some of them are taking a more bottoms up approach. So I can only really speak for this one small segment of this broader category that you're seeing, but in the ordering part of it, it depends on the, the company and whether it's bottoms up or top down. Right. Yeah. Um, but How about I, you though? What are you, what are you seeing? Cause I yeah. do see way more cause you're, you're actually doing more than just ordering. So we are, we yeah. are. And, and from our perspective, the way we, uh, so we, we started to describe Hilo as the Shopify of tenant experience, um, uh, really trying to create an ecosystem where, you know, building uh, our building partners, um, our other prop tech service provider partners, um, and then the end user, the customer, the tenant sort of come together and create this, this ecosystem. Um, and Hilo is really where we really want to be expert is to help deliver that, that seamless, beautiful, customer focused experience. Um, and ensure that we have the, the best engagement rates um, and, and our, our effort and our energy is spent working on engagement um, and not trying to replicate what you do or what a, um, a visitor management system will do or a um, contact entry system will do. Uh, we want to bring those partners into our ecosystem, allow our building partners to literally you know, come into our platform and check which systems, processes, programs you know, they want to activate um, and then what Hilo really helps them with is just delivering that to their customer um, and, uh, and focus on, you know, being the best and having tenants absolutely love um, where they work. Awesome. Well, I'm stoked and, on that. <laughs> and, and we think it's even more important uh, in this new flexible workspace and work from everywhere environment where people won't always be even in your building. Um, so if we don't stay connected, and really important in their world, then we grow, we get more distant and, and that's where, you know, there's danger. Love it. <clears throat> um, okay, can you share any details about something new you're working on or a challenge you're facing in light of the current world circumstances that you think our listeners might find interesting? Yeah, I mean, we're working on, and again, this is really applicable to building owners, um, a lot of virtual kitchen um, deals. So, Obviously, that's been talked a lot in the, if you follow the food and restaurant tech space, that's like a, a big thing ghost, right now. Ghost, ghost kitchens? Yeah, virtual kitchens, cloud kitchens, ghost kitchens, they call them all these names, or I don't know which one they're going to standardize on. I hope they pick one soon. Those, these are better marketers than me who pick these things. Um, but we are, you know, seeing a lot of that out of buildings in New York City, um, like repurposing some of the space at, to be a kitchen that you cook and do delivery out of, but it doesn't actually have a storefront. Um, and so we're, we're providing, we're in a lot of those deals now. That's like one thing that I'm trying to figure out how to market better to that. And then the other thing we're working on that is new and exciting for us is our launch of our, uh, tabs product. So being able to start a tab on your phone when you're, when you're at the restaurant so that we serve, 
um, cool. so we're really cool. excited about that. We think that'll be a, a game changing feature yeah. for, for mobile order and pay at, at restaurants. Definitely, definitely. So as opposed to leaving your credit card, um, it'll all be automated. Yeah, yeah. And then being able to easily add, you know, add more drinks to the experience. Or we have a lot of bars and restaurants. So, so right. that's what they, they've been asking for that. It's it's the opposite of the robot thing. We're, we're listening to the customers now. Right. Well, uh, listen, we've all got to be more customer focused, more customer centric. And uh, they're the ones that need to help drive, you know, where our product goes. So it makes a ton of sense. Yep. Uh, all right. Closing speed round and an opportunity to get to know you on a, a more personal level. All right. Uh, if you could have one superpower, what would it be? Uh, the ability to banter well with supervillains. <laughs> supervillains. Yeah, that's like the best super. Have you ever noticed, like in the comic books, like the best superheroes are the ones that can banter well with supervillains? Okay, I like that's, it. That's mine. That's that's from a movie called uh, one of my favorite comedies growing up called Mallrats. Okay. Um, it's a Kevin Smith movie. That's cool. They asked cool. they asked that question in the movie. All right. Did they? All right. Yeah. <laughs> um, what city or country do you want to travel to first when you are able and why? Um, I really want to go to uh, Copenhagen. I've not been that many places in Europe. That's one I want to go to. We have a customer there I, I really want to visit. Okay. All right. When you're not working, what are you doing? I'm thinking about new uh, product market fits for new startup ideas. <laughs> Pretty much. Like that's, I have a little bit of an obsession with that. Do you, uh, well, just so as, a, as an aside, do you think there's more, there's, there's other startups in your future? Oh yeah. I mean, till I die. Uh, awesome. It, yeah. Awesome. It is. Listen, I've been an entrepreneur my entire career, you know, right out of school, I got into public accounting and then ultimately got into the marketing and communications world, but I ran that business for 25 years. Um, and then, you know, find myself now as a, as a, a tech um, startup co-founder. I, I had no idea that this world existed. If I had known a long time ago, I would have done it a lot sooner. So I'm with you. Um, it is pretty exciting. Uh, the number one thing you miss about the workplace, and maybe for you, uh, based on your earlier answer, mm. it's, it's nothing. I'm not well, sure. I'll go, I'll go back to my Marquette or my, you know, when I was in the office days pre this startup, uh, I miss all the catered lunches. <laughs> we had Easy Cater as a plug for Easy Cater, but we had that at my one last startup I was at, and that was great. <laughs> All right, you were clearly destined to do something in the food industry, yeah. right? Uh, your favorite recent TV, streaming, movie, or series? You got to be watching something when you're oh, not. Oh man, this is. Time. Yeah, I mean, I'll just go with the. I guess the most recent. This is like a super trashy show, but un <laughs> Unreal on Hulu. Unreal. Okay. It's so trashy. It's like it's terror. It's not educational, but I right. like. Well, listen, it, it probably serves as a distraction from A, uh, real life, and B, you got you got to take a break from thinking about the startup world, you know, at some point during your day, right? Yeah. Uh, Steve, I'm really glad we were able to connect, um, and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Um, and uh, as you know, we're looking forward to collaborating with you yep. um, and bringing your platform into our, our, our ecosystem and enabling our food service retailers and our buildings to take advantage of your mobile ordering and, and payment processing system. Uh, so we look forward to continuing to work together and to continuing the conversation. All right. Thanks, David. Appreciate it. Thanks, Steve. Bye now. I want to thank Steve Simone for joining me on today's episode of 10 and for sharing his journey from early beginnings as an entrepreneur to now helping the hospitality industry run more efficiently with happier staff and guests. Great learning for all our listeners and an opportunity to gain insights into what it takes to become an innovation leader. Please be sure to follow 10 for future discussions with leading professionals and industry experts who all have something to say about the impact of technology on tenant experience in the built world. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on a future episode, please reach out to me directly at david at hiloapp.com. And until our next episode, I wish you all continued success in building community where you work and live. Thank you.